respected Ram Jaswalini ji to come to the dais. Also, Mr. Prasant Bhushan, the advocate, to come to the dais. But think that another member, KK School, she's an advocate, I said, no, I'm sorry, they will be joining us in a short time. Friends, I call session number two now in order. The subject is Black Money in Tax Havens and Foreign Banks. Mechanisms to curb corruption and abuse of power in the light of UN Convention on Corruption. Now, let me very briefly introduce you to the gentlemen who are going to participate. On my right is the redoubtable Ram Jet Malani. He will be celebrating, I think, 89 years in September. I had written an article some, a couple of years back in the Hindu. You'll get the reference later. And in that article I mentioned that Ram made an application in the Supreme Court saying, please take up my matter before the vacation. And the judges asked why. So he said, my astrologer has told me that I may not be there in July. <laughs> but Ram being fully unpredictable, he disappointed his astrologer. <laughs> and he was all there. So I wrote in my article, in 2007, come. I wrote in my article, in 2007, <coughs> I read a report that Ram had applied to the Supreme Court to take up his case early because his astrologer had told him that he might not be available after July. Obviously, the astrologer was a false prophet. My advice to Ram is not to believe in astrologers and go on to hit a century <laughs> with frequent sixes from time to time. I also wrote, Ram is in law ever green, ever energetic, ever enthusiastic, never one to give up and reminds one of ever green cricketer Sachin Tendulkar. Then I added, but his style is more in the Seva mold, brilliant, spectacular and audacious. Friends, when Ram speaks, and I'm going to introduce all the speakers at one go, so that we don't have an interruption, I'm sure you will be electrified by his eloquence. On my left is my very good friend KTS Tulsi, Vice Chairman of the Law Commission of India, <coughs> and he will give you a PowerPoint presentation, which of course is his speciality, and which creates an enormous impact on the audience, and will carry home a lot of new thoughts, which I'm sure Mr. Tulsi will give you. On my right again is Prashant Bhushan. I call him, he's like Jack the Giant Killer. Why? Because he's the gentleman who knocked out the CVC and obtained the great judgment from the Chief Justice of India, Kabadia saying you must have institutional integrity. <laughs> so that's why I call him Jack the Giant Killer. But apart from that, 
He is a unique lawyer in the sense that he says he is practicing only public interest law which doesn't fetch him any income. And that's a great sacrifice. <laughs> because by this time, he would have been probably in the top league of lawyers if he had chosen the path of private practice. And of course, we all know that his father Shanti Bhushan has encouraged it in this particular way. And we are going to have Shanti Bhushan, I think, in one of the sessions, is it today or tomorrow, he's agreed to chair a session. So that's Prashant Bhushan and he will tell you various things on this subject in which we are all interested. Lastly, we have got Apurva Sharma, one of our very active members and active office bearers. But in addition to that, he has now been elected Vice Chairman of the Bar Council of India. Now, all over India, Bar Councils are not very highly regarded for whatever reasons, because of the elective element. And I am sure Apurva will bring in dynamism and reform Bar Councils of India. We don't want to go the way of the Medical Councils of India. You have seen what is happening. So we have to strive. We should help them, they should help us, and we should have common programs by which we can go forward and at least look inward. Because one of the things which we have said is looking inward and looking outward. Now we have been looking outward, <laughs> criticizing others, but let us also at the right time look inward and criticize ourselves. With these few remarks, may I ask Ram to make his presentation. Please give him a big hand. Chairman, my colleagues on the stage, my colleagues at the bar, and other ladies and gentlemen, I must confess that I am a little under the weather for the last one week. Nothing very serious has happened, but I have lost my voice. I have done my best to recoup as far as I could. I have, I have been able to recoup something at least. I am going to be audible. But I think I have lost the kind of uh, slight flavor that I have in my spoken words. You will pardon me for that. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me make a confession. Whatever my astrologer might have said, and however much I have falsified him completely, I do still feel like a person who is sitting in the departure lounge of an airport, waiting for the flight to be called. Anytime the flight might be called, and then there is no getting back. It is in that mood that I live these days without ambition, without any unfulfilled desires except one. I have started life in India as a refugee from Pakistan. I have started my life in a refugee camp. I came to India with a 10 rupee note in my pocket as my <coughs> only asset. And whatever I am today, and deserving the honor of being called here to address you, it is because of the blessings and the cooperation of the people of this country. I owe a deep debt <coughs> of gratitude to them and it is my last and only surviving ambition that I must at least repay a part of the debt which I owe to them. The black money case 
has given me exactly that chance of fulfilling my desire and my last wish. So ladies and gentlemen, be sure that when I speak, my speech has the credibility of a dying declaration almost. And I don't particularly measure my words. I'm not too polite by nature. <coughs> Certainly not polite to those who don't deserve any politeness. I got involved in this as a member of parliament. And unfortunately, my term in the Rajya Sabha came to an end in 2010, in 2009. I lost the platform for public speaking. But ladies and gentlemen, it is in the next year, after nearly a gap of a year, that I was invited to rejoin the party from which I had almost been investigated. I hope I am not sharing a great party secret, but I rejoined because deep down there was in me a feeling that I still need the platform of the parliament to be able to ask some inconvenient questions. But on the other hand, I did make it clear to those who asked me to get back into politics in that sense again that you know my views on all subjects which are pending before the nation. Please don't ask me to change any of my views. Don't try and change me, but I have the right to change you. It is on that footing that today I am a member of a political party. I believe every word that fell from the earlier sessions, the speaker, Mr. Arun Kumar, a non-lawyer. He spoke of a prescription which I believe is true. All other prescriptions have been tried before and they have failed. And I think we are wasting our time trying to repeat the experiment with those failed medicines that have been suggested. Law reform is not the solution. There are too many laws on our statute book. When I was a law minister, I appointed a commission to go into the entire statute book of the country. And my expert, honest friends reported that at least 1100 laws require to be repealed. They are totally, totally useless. It's not counterproductive. When I gave that report to my bureaucrats, they came back with the astonishing counter-report that only three laws required to be repeated. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm old enough to understand how the bureaucratic mind works. Every law contains some power for some bureaucrat. And they were not willing to give up. How many? How many powers all at one go? And ladies and gentlemen, during my short tenure as the law minister, I believe I repealed at least 500 statutes on the book. Every week, we used to put a large number of statutes and have one unanimous repealing statute. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not the law which is to be to be found fault with. <coughs> law has become a convenient escape route, this escape route in the hands of corrupt and inefficient politicians. Every time something goes wrong, or they say there is something wrong with the law, then they pass that law and tell the people that look, we were so serious about the law, now we have done our best, now we leave you to your fate, little realizing that that was the pretense the new law is itself a source of new corruption. 
What we require is a reformed character and not reformed law. And character cannot be reformed by legislation. Character can be reformed, if at all, by a reformed parliament with a reformed character, but not by the kind of laws which are being suggested or even today are on the end, not even the Lokpal bill of Anna Hazare. I am an admirer of Anna Hazare. He has at least quickened the conscience of the nation today towards the problem of corruption. And I believe that the crowds that collected for his darshan, when he was around and talking to us about corruption, they were all victims of corruption in their daily life. That's the great, great tribute to be paid to Anna Hadare, that he really meant to talk about corruption. He is serious about removing corruption. But I am not quite sure about all the methods that he has adopted for that purpose. I mean, I am nobody to criticize him. In fact, I am his disciple in the sense that he and I have a common cause and I shall always place my energies at his disposal if he wants them at all. But ladies and gentlemen, there are many people who are in the war against corruption but they don't seem to need my assistance or advice. I want to do to pay to my chairman of this meeting today, Mr. Nalit Diwan. <coughs> I found in him a wonderful counsel. He has been my counsel in the petition with which I went to the Supreme Court. He drafted it. He has fought it. And I believe that he got from the Supreme Court, extracted from the Supreme Court, the, one of the best judgments that the Supreme Court has ever delivered. So what I am telling you, my friends, today is an echo of the submission that he has made to the Supreme Court and the submissions which have been partly accepted by the Supreme Court, none of them have been rejected, others are waiting to be accepted. But in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, has arisen a huge obstacle and that obstacle is the Supreme Court itself. I do not propose to mince my words. <coughs> Two judges, Mr. Reddy and Mr. Dijer, they delivered a unanimous judgment of the two judges and I propose to read to you some of the findings. The findings returned by the Supreme Court are such that any government with a sense of little feeling of self-respect ought to have resigned forthwith. But no, <coughs> Arun Kumar talked of strengthening our democracy. I want to ask him, I wanted to ask the question, but I ultimately didn't have the courage to get up and ask the question. People will say, now what is wrong with Mr. Jetvilani that he is asking the question from one of the panelists. I wanted to ask him that Mr. Arun Kumar, your prescription is right, but please tell me, how do we strengthen democracy? The greatest weakness which everybody talks about Indian democracy is the weakness that we have a majority of illiterate voters in the country. <coughs> they are not only illiterate, but they are starved and most of them are poor. So they don't have really the expertise of exercising the sovereignty which in the theory of the constitution rests in them. But ladies and gentlemen, when I look back to the history of Indian democracy, I want to pay a tribute to the poor man of this country. Whenever our democracy has almost been put in the coffin of the day, it is the poor illiterate voter who has revived democracy from the coffin. It is the educated rascal who has let down Indian democracy. So ultimately, I believe that we must strengthen the common man and that is the only way to strengthen democracy in this country. And once again, when you talk of strengthening the common man, you have to give him two, two pieces of treasure which he lacks woefully. That is a decent livelihood 
and a decent education. <coughs> Both require money. And ladies and gentlemen, what hurts me most today and